let's turn it over to our panelists and our first speaker, Maria. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm excited. Great. Thank you and uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be part of the conversation. Um, I wanted to um, share with you my story today um, for two main reasons. One, um, I believe that we are um, better healthcare executives um, and uh, better human beings if we keep in mind the um, the personal side, the human side of all technology. And um, secondly, I think that there's many patients out there who are going through um, what I describe a very non-traditional uh, situation where they find themselves in an end of one um, type of experience. And I think that might be helpful for them. I invite you to join in the conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to step away um, after I um, give you a little bit of a taste of my ex experience, but um, I invite your comments and questions afterwards over email or uh, Twitter. So um, in terms of, in, by way of introduction, um, I've been in healthcare for the last 15 years, studying how um, positive outliers come to, to being. Um, anything from um, startups to um, healthcare outcomes that were very low probability of success, but high um, impact once they were uh, realized. And in my 15 years of experience, um, I always asked myself, what are the, um, what is that first initial impetus that, that pushed the first domino, if you will, that led the rest of the dominoes to fall in place and um, create this cascade of, of miracles that we sometimes need? And why is it that healthcare is such a um, exceptionally difficult case and industry to get this uh, to happen? Um, less than 5% of the uh, unicorns in 2017 were happening in healthcare. And uh, according to name your study, uh, healthcare tends to lag uh, by a decade in adoption of some of the uh, most, what we would describe, well adopted and, and well proven exponential technologies. Um, and so, in those 15 years of studying this as a consultant or as a healthcare executive, I frankly um, didn't make as much progress as um, the last 15 months uh, when I experienced healthcare as, as a patient. And that happened in a very um, routine, non-expectant non way, right? We are all busy living our lives, going from one meeting to, meeting to another when a routine doctor visit fall ends with oh, maybe we should get this checked out. Um, and this is what happened to me. I had a meeting with my PCP who uh, did a palpation exam on my abdomen and said, mm, this doesn't feel right. Um, why don't we take another look? And so we did an ultrasound, then we did a CT, then we did a CT, repeat CT with contrast. And then um, what came back to was, was this. Um, the radiology report basically showed that I had a extremely large angiomyolipoma associated with um, my right kidney. And by extremely large, we mean um, they actually meant 36 centimeters uh, by 16 by 15. Um, for those uh, football fans or American football fans in the room, that's pretty much the size of an American football or by volume. It's the size of, of the soccer ball that we, we, we use. And so th this was extremely rare, um, extremely low probability of event happening for two reasons. One, um, angiomyolipomas are actually very uh, common tumors, kidney tumors. The fact that it was such a large size um, was very abnormal. And the fact that I was um, asymptomatic when we found it was, um, was equally surprising. Um, the other piece that was very unique here was that in addition to that um, angiomyolipoma, I was also diagnosed with a very uh, rare lung condition, um, which pretty much happens one in one million um, childbearing women. And, and that was uh, extremely um, rare again, because the genetic test that is associated or the genetic um, marker that was associated with um, with both the angiomyolipoma and the LAM, the lung condition, was not present in me. So both of these were 
um, diagnosed as sporadic uh, cases. And because of the size, uh, um, even though I was still uh, asymptomatic, it was very difficult to think about surgery um, because of the risk of bleeding. And it was also extremely difficult to think about um, embolization or going in and, or stopping the blood flow to the tumor because of the size again. And none of these things were um, have been done. I have to say that um, back in January 17 uh, last year, when I found about this, find out about this, I was extremely, um, as a patient, um, I was uh, taken aback and um, I was very um, startled, right? After you go through the whole question of why me and what does this mean? Um, I promised myself two things. One, I promised that this is not going to define me. And um, I will continue to, um, uh, to live my life, given the fact that I was given a gift that I was still asymptomatic. And the second thing I promised myself was that I would not accept um, uh, the, the assumptions that others had and that I would not accept the, uh, there, is no, there, is, there is no options um, as a status quo. And so I took a couple of, I made a couple of decisions at that, at that point that I think are very um, applicable for uh, many other situations that are described um, or characterized by these very unique situations where you are dealing with unprecedented, low probability of success outcome. Um, my, the outcome that I defined for me was I wanted to remove the tumor um, safely, uh, preserving both, while preserving both my kidneys and not disrupting my life. And to do that, um, I took on a couple of things. First, I, we all um, probably have heard the um, principle, the, um, the principle of first, first principle thinking, um, which has to do with just deconstructing what we know to the bare uh, truths or to the fundamental truths, um, stripping our knowledge from assumptions or preconceived limitations. And in my case, the assumption was um, that the tumor that I had was too big to do anything with. Um, and uh, the, the assumption was in many cases that once you get that diagnosis, it becomes a verdict rather than a diagnosis. And what I started doing after that was I changed my mindset from um, a sick patient or patient to a tumor relationship to a more of a friendly relationship, if you will. What you're seeing on the screen is a 3D um, model version of uh, my tumor, the green mass on the screen. Um, the kidney is that brown, smaller mass, um, and the other big brown mass was the, is the liver. And so what you're seeing in this case is that the entire right-hand side of my abdomen was basically taken up by the tumor. Um, what I also found out was that, um, again, following the principle of let's really get to the bottom of what we know and what are the facts versus what are the assumptions, the facts are that I've had this tumor for about 10 or more years. The facts are that that tumor um, was uh, comprising mostly of fat, a smooth muscle, and blood vessels, and it has slow growing and mostly it was benign. And with those facts, I actually shifted my thinking from a antagonistic thinking between, you know, a patient who just got a verdict um, to a more friendly uh, type of mindset where I saw the tumor as a friendly teenager who could have done actually much more damage to me and my, my body, uh, while in fact it was um, relatively considerate and gentle, so as far as tumors go. And in that mindset, I... I named my tumor. So uh, what you're seeing here, the friendly green mass is Bertha. Um, no special reason other than the fact that evoked um, association with bigness. Um, and, and so Bertha uh, and I got to know each other. Um, I uh, sequenced her, uh, did a, a full genomic sequencing done at uh, Health Nucleus. 
Um, as you see, this is the 3D model. Um, I studied her and um, saw um, all different experts um, on from urology to kidney to um, oncologists to liver surgeons to geneticists. Um, and I took her traveling with me. With me, so we um, I continued to do my work, uh, which took me traveling to many different countries. So um, Bertha was um, um, an integral part of my life. But as I promised myself, um, the facts were uh, not as frightening. Um, the facts were I had a very unique situation, and um, and I was very determined to keeping my promise, which was. Uh, continuing my life um, as it was, uh, which led me to the second key decision, uh, which had to do with uh, playing by your own rules when you're in a world of N equals one. In those situations, like in, um, uh, if you're building a new company that has never existed before, or if you're dealing with a, a healthcare situation that no one really has seen before, Precedents and white papers and best practices are not always there to support you and give you a crutch. And in that case, you could either despair or think of it as a blank piece of paper or an open field where you could um, make your own rules and, and create something truly unique and different. In my case, the fact that um, Bertha didn't neatly fit in any of the disciplines allowed me to invite into the conversation um, data scientists and programmers and 3D modeling experts and exponential technologists um, and just my friends and support who kept and support network who kept me sane. And in that multidisciplinary um, cross-functional, cross-geographical network, what we quickly started to realize is the fact that Bertha, Bertha was so large could work actually to our advantage because it could be something that some of the medical community perceives as, as a very attractive feature that they could try and do something with. And so very quickly we were able to find um, an interventional radiologist in Boston who um, saw the size of, of Bertha and um, actually said that based on his research, he thought he can control and embolize um, the tumor. And so what we did was we had a six hour embolization where we were able to take um, off the blood supply uh, for about 90%, 98, 95% of the um, blood vessels that were feeding the tumor. It was a very, very successful uh, procedure um, that was... Um, again, um, truly um, interesting. And we were able to do it because uh, we were able to say that uh, the fact that it hasn't been done before didn't, um, wasn't necessarily a, a limiting factor. Um, after the embolization, um, what was really um, important was to, to think about the new state of um, equilibrium or homeostasis that I needed to find in my, in my body. And um, that's what leads me to my next learning, which has to do with anticipating changes in your own um, homeostasis. So the body finds a way of um, being in homeostasis, whether or not you have a large tumor associated with your kidney. And after we embolized the, the tumor, um, that homeostasis was interrupted. Um, there were a couple of unintended consequences that, that were associated with this. It had to do with um, anything from pericarditis to paralyzed vocal cord. And we still don't know why some of these happen given that we were so careful and uh, during the embolization. Um, but for me, the learning here was that irrespective of um, a healthcare tumor or for example, uh, uh, building a new innovation initiative, antibodies are actually going to start um, uh, coming at you when you're trying to do things in a new, uh, non-traditional way. And that precious equilibrium, even if it's not the long-term sustainable equilibrium that your body or your organization needs, um, you need to keep it in mind because every time you tinker with it, um, unintended consequences happen. Um, with 
the next phase of my journey, I got to learn a lot about um, what people might consider the basics or um, the boring baseline. Um, I think uh, some of the most important work that had to get done uh, for my full recovery had to do with um, establishing um, a dynamic baseline that um, in today's world, given all the access to um, IoT devices we have, it's so easy to be able to track all your uh, vitals. I was able to do that. However, just having the data is not enough. Being able to action on it is what's really um, making the difference between um, being a, a, a rapidly recovering patient and um, and effectively coming back with complications. And so in my case, um, our the data that I was capturing needed to be connected to my baseline of like health, how when I was healthy before the surgery, before any of the embolization. Um, we didn't do that. And because of that, uh, when I was having symptoms associated with um, kidney infection, we didn't catch that early enough on time. And with, with that type of situation uh, for me, it was incredibly um, insightful to think about that we were able to accomplish something fairly complex, like a six hour embolization on a 36 centimeter uh, tumor, but we couldn't really follow through and connect the dots between what is abnormal heart rate for a patient uh, relative to their baseline, even though it may still be below uh, what literature considers normal. And so for as I, as I think about my next steps on the journey, I keep coming back to that dynamic baseline and what the data actually means once we've collected it. Um, you've probably figured out the uh, end of the story. It's a positive story. It's a good outcome. We were able, after, to, after the embolization, we were able to um, remove surgically Bertha um, and the surgery happened uh, just a couple of months ago uh, in March this year. What you're seeing on the left-hand side um, is the full tumor resected from my right kid kidney. I was able, we were able to save both kidneys. Um, I was um, very lucky. Um, I was just, um, I got a, you know, a great experience and a minimal scar out of that um, 15 months. Um, and great experience in terms of learnings. Uh, what Bertha got was a far, fair away, a fair away, um, going away party or farewell party um, to commemorate the um, really amazing group of people that helped me get where I was. Um, Shauna Butler is with us today, who has been one of the key contributors to my sanity and my um, positive outcome, actually. Um, and we can't understate the, the, the importance of the mindset and the importance of a, an amazing team uh, when we think about um, our personal journeys or professional journeys when it comes to coming up with um, low probability, high, high impact outcomes. Um, so I really invite you to think about um, your next adventure, personally or professionally, in the context of uh, first principle thinking and the context of creating your own rules, um, establishing a dynamic baseline and minding the equilibrium, the precious equilibrium that you need to uh, constantly revert back to. Um, and with that in mind, I really challenge us all to think about the next outlier or unicorn that we might wanna go after and um, shared experience and the learnings of how you how you were able to do that. I'm really thankful for that experience. I'm thankful for all the people who were with me uh, along the lines. And as I said, um, I'm here to continue the conversation on this. Thank you so much, Maria. What an amazing story about you and Bertha. And of course, the journey uh, that you both went through all the way to her farewell party, so to say. Um, yeah. And thanks for the learnings that you share with us. We uh, realize um, that you have to leave us now, um, but we are happy to connect people with you. Um, after the call, you uh, left your email address and your Twitter handle here. Um, and if anybody have some, has some questions for Maria, uh, please let us know and uh, we'll connect you. Thanks again. Thank you.